a first feature of the law. It claims our total obedience. Before we begin a detailed treatment of each point, it would be good to understand, in the first place, the overall nature of the law. First, then, we must recognize that the law is meant to rule and direct man's life not only to outward honesty, but to inward and spiritual righteousness. This is not something which anyone would deny, yet very few are serious about it. Because no one cares about the lawgiver, by whose character the character of the law itself must be judged. If a king were to forbid by edict, debauchery, murder and theft, I admit that anyone who simply felt the desire to be promiscuous, or to steal or murder, but who stopped short without attempting to act, would not have to pay the prescribed penalty. That is because the purview of the mortal lawgiver goes no further than outward decency. As long as no wrong is done, his laws are not infringed. But God, from whose eyes nothing is hidden, and who does not stop so much at the outward appearance of virtue as at purity of heart, in forbidding debauchery, murder and robbery, forbids all fleshly desire, hatred, greed for another's goods, deceit and the like. Because he is a spiritual lawgiver, he speaks no less to the soul than to the body. So wrath and hatred are murder, so far as the soul is concerned, greed is robbery and undisciplined love is debauchery. Someone perhaps will say that human laws, too, are concerned with men's will and intentions, and not just with random events. I agree, but there it is a matter of intentions which are openly expressed. The law in such cases considers the purpose of each and every act, but does not seek to know our hidden motives, so everyone who does not outwardly transgress satisfies the civil law. By contrast, because God's law is addressed to our souls, we cannot really obey it unless our souls are particularly kept in check. Most men, especially when they want to hide their contempt of the law, in some way train their eyes, feet, hands, and other limbs to keep the law's commands. All the while, their heart knows nothing of obedience, but they think themselves absolved if they conceal from men the things which are visible to God. They hear the words, You shall not kill, you shall not commit debauchery, you shall not steal. As a result, they do not unsheathe the sword to kill. They do not associate with the promiscuous. They do not lay hands on other people's property. All that is well and good, but their heart is full of murder and burns with fleshly lust. They cast only sideways glances at their neighbor's property, but are consumed by greed. In that respect, the essence of the law escapes them. How, I ask, can they be so unthinking, if not because, ignoring the lawgiver, they try to reconcile righteousness with their own understanding? Against such ideas, Paul protests loudly and clearly, asserting that the law is spiritual. By this he means that it demands not only obedience from the soul, mind and will, but angelic purity, which cleansed of every bodily stain, savours only of the spirit. In declaring this to be the meaning of the law, we are not offering a new explanation of our own, but are following Christ, who is a very sound expositor of it. Since the Pharisees had spread among the people the holy evil idea that the law could be dutifully observed provided no external transgression was committed, he denounces their error and says that to look lustfully at a woman is immoral and that all who hate their brother are murderers. Thus, all who, in their hearts, harbour anger of any kind, he condemns as guilty of judgment. All who, by grumbling, display a resentful spirit are guilty before the church court. All who, by slander, give proof of malice are guilty of hellfire. Those who did not understand this imagined Christ to be a second Moses who introduced gospel law to make up for what the Mosaic law lacked. 
Hence the popular saying that the perfection of gospel law is far superior to that of the old law. Now that is a most perverse error. It is a statement which does great disservice to God's law, as we will see from Moses' own words when we later review the sum of his precepts. It might also be inferred from this idea that the holiness of the ancient patriarchs was little more than hypocrisy. Its effect, lastly, would be to turn us away from the sole and perpetual rule of righteousness which God set forth at that time. It is an error easily refuted. These people think that Christ was merely adding to the law. In reality, he was restoring to it its integrity by cleansing it of the lies and leaven of the Pharisees which had failed and defiled it.